Hi, I'm Blaine Lewis, founder and director of New Approach School for Jewelers, and I'm here once again with my friends at Rio Grande. Today we're going to talk about how to make the bench work for you. Look, there's a lot of different body types, but there's only a few bench heights that are basically built, and I want to help you make the bench more responsive to you, want to go through how to adjust for your daily task and how they change the different height requirements for, say, sawing and filing versus stone setting. And uh, I've got some great tools sitting here on the bench to help you with those. And we want to go all the way up to the microscope here. And using a microscope is one of the just best things that's happened for especially shortening your learning curve for engraving or stone setting. And I'll show you how to properly set it up and make it fluid for you. So let's get started. So when I first started, one of the mistakes I made was that I built my own bench. And it was lower than it should be. And so I started, like most people, I started at doing sawing and filing and sizings and chain repairs. And on those kind of, and that kind of work, I wasn't doing stone setting at first. On that kind of work, we use what I call the perspective view. If I'm going to file a ring, I'm using this view and I'm looking at the overall ring and how I'm approaching it. If I'm sawing it, I'm looking at how I'm following the line. But for stone setting, stone setting is different. Stone setting is you really need to be up higher because what I call the horizon view. You need to look at direct relationships of those stones, the tilt, the pan or tilt this way. You have to look at all of those things, so you have to come up. So when I started, was doing that bench work for a, a, about two years, things were fine. When I went to stone setting, it, it became a high magnification sport pretty quick. And I found myself using a loop and leaning over and spending a lot of time up close on that work. I didn't know to elevate my work to change the height of how I was working. So I started having neck pain and I started having some headaches. And somebody taught me finally about really proper ergonomics and somebody who, who uh, worked in rehabilitative services and they taught me some things that I'm gonna pass on to you. So it all starts at first with really setting properly. You know, I talked about the, we all have different body heights and, and the benches aren't exactly designed to accommodate all of that. So let's just get started at the foundation. And the foundation is, is always use an adjustable chair and set with your feet, your shins, your thighs, your torso, all of that at nice 90 degree angles. If you set too high and your feet are kind of dangling, it puts a lot of pressure on the back of the legs and you push on that artery and you ultimately reduce your blood flow and we all know now that sitting is not the most healthy, so sitting properly would definitely absolutely help. Um, so we'll start with this, get this to the right um, specifications for your body. Then I want to show you easy tools to take and adjust the bench height so that you can come down and bring your work down to where you need to be. So let's say for instance, I'm looking at this bench here, and this is about 38 inches tall, which is fairly standard. And so if I was doing sawing and filing at this bench, this right here would be a little bit high for me. So it's real easy to bring down, and this is called a drop-down adapter. And GRS's drop-down adapter has lots of holes, and the, the dovetail is able to be moved in half-inch increments. And so I can move this a number of different ways to, make, to give me the perspective view that I'm looking for. When it comes to stone setting, I've got to come up. So take these off and put on the benchmate. And if you're a beginner, this is something that I think is really important for helping you file better, but it's my favorite tool for basic stone setting. It's adjustable. It's another set of hands. When you, get, when you put a ring in it, your left hand is free, and you're able to move things around and position them. It has the ability to adjust up and down by these two bolts here. 
And so for me, I'm going to bring this up a little bit. Now, that feels more natural to me. And what makes it feel more natural to me is that if I'm going to file the top of this signet ring, I want that surface to be aligned with my elbow and my forearm and my palm, like I said earlier. I don't want this surface to be so high that my elbows are way high in the air. Just a nice natural like this, and then I can push the file forward. When it comes to filing the side of a ring, the nice thing about the Benchmade is I can tilt, I can do a lot of different things. I can obviously reposition this so that I could file, say, the top part of this curve. One of the things that I like about the new Benchmade, and I helped GRS um, design this, is that it has this cutaway and it allows us to take a surface like this and to file it where normally we might be hitting the side of it. We're able to pass all the way through this, so this cutaway is here on the side. These are just some simple things that you can do to help you get started off on the right foot from the beginning. So now what I'd like to do is talk about some more advanced things, like let's look at an engraving ball and how that affects your positioning. So here's a, a pretty standard engraving ball with, um, with a shelf. If I was engraving the top of this ring, this would absolutely be too high for me. Um, many different tasks that we do are going to require this, um, you know, changing the elevation. So what I'd like to show you now is what I think is one of the best tools um, that's been, been invented in a while. This is called the slide lock. And this tool takes the dovetails that these things fit on, but they lock onto the bench and I'll show you they allow us to reposition things in a way that's very fluid and happens right now very quickly. Quickly, to get an idea of what this tool does, you have uh, a cam lever here and it allows this tool and those to move up and down freely until you get it where you want it you decide to lock it. So put this on the bench and I'll bring the engraving ball in and if I was filing or using a, a, a graver on this, this is too high for me. This is up in the air a little too high. So a little flick very quickly. I think I'll go a little more. So this now is set so that I'm in this natural movement plane with my arm. So the slide lock is really useful for all these tools that I've shown, but I think it's absolutely essential for using microscopes. And that's what we're going to talk about next. So when you pull this microscope out of the box, um, many times I think it's confusing on exactly how to, how to best get started. It's pretty stiff when it comes out. It's pretty tight. You have uh, adjuster knobs here that allow you to loosen things up a bit. And when you loosen them and pull them forward, it can be quite a tug. What you probably will find is you'll have to sit and make some adjustments into these bolts also because they all have to do with the overall tension of what holds the weight of this head out on this extended arm. So get it so that it's fluid, but it doesn't fall down with these um, uh, tightener handles here, which are, are your primaries. Get it set so that it's, it's nice with that. Then once you, you get where you want to go, you can tighten these up. Um, and then you've got, once I tighten this, tighten this, then I've got something that's nice and stable and it's not, it's not floating. I'd like to show you how to properly set up a scope. And there's a lot of tricks to doing this so that you can actually feel comfortable working with this. So step number one for me is to understand not only what your focal distance is from the bottom of the lens, but what's really most important is, is what, how that relates from the eyepiece down so that then you can measure from your eye down and set your work. So here's how I do it. Okay. 
So right out of the box, I'll turn the light on. I'll set up a ring. These knobs right here, this is the zoom knob. So this is higher or lower power magnification. This is the fine focus knob. The gross focus is within the stand itself and how you move it. What I like to start out with is to identify the travel distance of the fine focus and start in the middle. That way I can use it without having to go back and you know, loosen and retighten the stand. So I want to pull an image in front of it and at the lowest zoom power, so the widest field of view, I want to look at this and I want to raise the fine focus up and down. And I want to not, I can see inside that it's getting better as I go up, but when I go all the way up, it stops and I'm still not in focus. That means that I've got to bring this up higher. So let's do that. Lock it back down again. So now I should be bringing it down. Okay. So that's um, in Chris focus. You might notice that I'm using one eye. When you first start out to set it up and to get an idea of what's going on, use one eye. So there's a binocular effect with the eyepieces and they have to be set properly to your fixed pupil distance. And I'll be a lot more on that in a few minutes. But just go with one eye and just get the image that you want in focus. So I have that. Now, if you'll do this, if you'll measure from the bench top, which is just your work surface, to the center of the eyepiece, okay, then you'll have your fixed working distance, and I've got 15 and a half inches. So from this, we now get to transfer that to sitting down and using that 15 and a half inches from your eye down. I want to take my measuring tape and I've got my pinky right here at 15 and a half inches. So I want to put that close to the center of my eye, not looking straight forward, but looking with a slight tilt down because then my eye needs to align with this eyepiece. And as you can see here, my work surface, if I'm holding that properly, needs to come down. If I'm going to focus on this, it needs to come down. So I'll bring the slide lock down bring the scope down more to naturally what my eye, what, what, what I feel comfortable viewing through and just a little bit more. So you want just, you want your neck to be fairly straight with just a slight tilt and that's good. And I, you want to look through the concept is to look through the middle of the tubes. So let's take a look before I have to go up and set the top. Let's go back again now at 15 and a half inches from here, from the eyepiece, and I'll just t drift this in straight for a close proximity, and I've still got to come down lower. This is what the reality of it. You have to get it right, and you can't sit too high or too low, so this is it. We'll lower it down. So at 15 and a half inches from my eyepiece, I'll drift inward with the tape and I'm there. Okay. So now I'm going to use the one eye approach again, and I'm going to bring the scope in or out. I have the ability to move around the object. And so I've got some room on the shelf and now I have it centered. That's looking with one eye. So now what I'd like to talk about is how to get yourself in binocular focus. Look, it's the same as when we were kids and we had binoculars. We had to adjust the binoculars to fit our fixed pupil distance. One of the best ways to do that and to think about it is to actually just gaze forward at about a 14 inches or so. I call it the daydream gaze where, where you're just not paying attention to anything and your eyes relax because you want your eyes to be relaxed. You don't want to try to look at this as a viewfinder. You're not trying to find the image. You want the image to come to you in a nice relaxed fashion. 
And so I'll show you how to set up the scope and how to do all those things. So I'll bring the scope in and I'm using one eye right now. Again, this is, I think, the most efficient way to do it because it, we don't have to worry about the binocular, uh, getting the binoculars right. Let's just get the image in the center of one eye piece. And it doesn't matter whether you use your right eye or your left, let's use one eye. And let's get a basic focus going. So I'm in, in basic focus and I am all the way out. So my field of view is as wide as it can be. From this point now, I need to, the next step would be to get the binocular straight here for my fixed pupil distance. I'll go and with both eyes look through the tubes and I just want to gaze forward in a soft gaze. I don't want to look for it. I want to move the tubes until I get one nice round image. I know it's there because I had it with one eye. So literally the only thing is now is do you have the binocular right? Once you get the binocular right and you're really relaxed and you've got it, go ahead and establish your best fo focus at the lower power. This is done at the widest field of view. It's easier to get things in the center. Then we'll go up and we'll bring the power all the way up to its highest magnification. Take your fine focus and get that to be the very best that you can get it. And from that point, once you've gotten it the best, you zoom all the way out. And from here, we're now going to tune these eyepieces to your eye. I always start with my left eye closed and my right eye open, but you might feel comfortable doing it in reverse. I'm going to use close my left eye, and so I'm looking through the right eye and the right ocular, and I'm going to turn this in a better or worse situation slowly, allowing my eye time to adjust till I get it the very best. Then I'm going to do the same on the left eye. Just take your time, get it right. Then when I open up both eyes, the test to know that you have it right is when you zoom the microscope up and down it stays in perfect stereo focus. If, you, if it goes out of focus while you zoom the scope, you do not have the eyepieces right, and you can go back and start the process over again. In closing, don't let the bench dictate how you work, but instead, let it work for you.